what we are going to do this in these next 40 minutes or so is to look at the confusion in Europe, which uh, is behind a part of the problem, which is part of the problem. So uh, Sweden is shaken up for 206 or eight years. You have enjoyed peace and that has enabled Sweden to blossom. Um, um, the last war that Sweden fought was 1814. Um, in a new world war, uh, hopefully Russia will treat you as neutral and uh, Russia honors you for being neutral, different than Ukraine, which was uh, flirting with NATO. You have not flirted with NATO and uh, Putin uh, respects that and hopes that you will continue that to stay out of the Third World War. Uh, Finland is a little more problematic uh, because uh, Finland was in fact part of Swedish colony which became Russian colony and thanks to Lenin became free uh, in 1917. Uh, but uh, it has been, uh, uh, Putin has not praised Finland's neutrality. It has praised uh, Sweden's neutrality and Austrian neutrality, um, uh, but not Finland's neutrality, which is problematic. So um, uh, with that uh, question, the, with this background of a very delicate situation in, um, in uh, Europe, you have very good reasons to be concerned. And that's what I want to focus on reflecting theologically the Bible's impact on Europe, which is incomplete. Uh, let me uh, begin with a specific illustration. Um, Hans Joachim, who uh, may join us online, he was uh, translating for me in a very large uh, German event about six, seven years ago. Uh, where the two, three thousand leaders of businessmen, church leaders in Germany, just as I stood up to speak, uh, a official representative of um, the organizers walked up, climbed up uh, to the platform, came to me and whispered in my ear, that please do not talk about nation in this lecture. You know, somebody must have heard me talk about nation and nationalism. So he was making this formal request that I do not speak about nation and nationalism because in Germany, this is a very sensitive, delicate issue. Now, he was a Christian advising me not to talk about it. So of course, I, it was too stubborn and decided to talk precisely about that because this was this is a foolishness of liberal humanism in Europe. The question that Putin has raised right now is should Ukraine, the Ukrainians, love their nation? Should they defend their nation? Should they fight for their nation? Should they set, uh, sh shed their blood for their nation? Is nation important? And here was German uh, Christian leaders telling me not to talk about nation because this is a dirty word in Europe. Um, but Putin has forced a uh, liberal intelligentsia in Europe to reconsider if nation is not important, if national borders are not important, what's the problem with uh, Russia taking over part of Ukraine, if not all of Ukraine and colonizing it? Is there a moral reason 
why the international border should be respected, held sacred. Now, this is important for Sweden because irony is that Sweden became an empire after the Thirty Year War uh, from 1618 to 1648. It was during that Thirty Year War that Holland, particularly Holland, had fought for 80 years, 50 years before um, that Thirty Year War, and then during the Thirty Year War, Holland fought against the Holy Roman Empire, particularly its proxy France, in order to create the first uh, nation in Europe, uh, self-consciously uh, creating, importing Jewish Protestant idea of nation into Europe, which had since the days of Alexander the Great embraced the pagan idea of empire. So 1648 was uh, the end of uh, the 30-year war in the Peace of Westphalia, um, where Sweden was an important player. Uh, the Protestant Christianity, and Sweden had become Protestant, Sweden was fighting on the side of Protestantism, but Swedish theology had not embraced the Jewish Protestant idea of a nation. It was after the Thirty Year War that uh, Sweden became an empire and became a strong empire um, until it began to lose some of its territory. Uh, Sweden colonized uh, Finland, as you know, for centuries. Uh, before Russia uh, took over Finland. So um, uh, the, uh, this conflict in Ukraine today should force Christian think tanks, Christian intelligentsia to rethink biblical theology of nation and empire and which, which has not happened. In fact, um, uh, the, the Christian theology in Europe has surrendered to secular and Roman Catholic and Orthodox attack on the Protestant concept of nation. So in 1648, in the Peace of Westphalia, for where Holland had suffered much to create the first modern nation in Europe and Switzerland piggybacked on it because Switzerland had remained neutral during the Thirty Year War. And therefore, uh, the mayor of Basel was, uh, Basel was sent to uh, Westphalia to argue that the Swiss Confederacy, which had existed for three, four hundred years, uh, should be considered as a sovereign nation just like the Netherlands is becoming a sovereign nation. So Switzerland and Holland became the first, the two first sovereign nations, which was turning uh, the history of Europe around, beginning with that piece of Westphalia, most of the nations of the world became free, except for the nations after World War II. Most of the nations, most of the colonies, became free nation, uh, except for those which USSR colonized after World War II. France, England, Germany, everybody, um, Belgium, everybody gave up their colonies, set them uh, as free independent nation. This was a great triumph of biblical Christianity, uh, Jewish Protestant idea of a nation, but the Roman Catholics, Orthodox, and the secularists did not accept the biblical vision of nation. Uh, and Europe has remained confused. A lot of the clarity on this issue came from America, and I'll describe that in a few minutes. A lot of the clarity came from uh, America, 
and because of which all the colonies became free nations, including India, especially India. Uh, India was debated between Winston Churchill, uh, who was the colonial ruler of India in, in 1940, and uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the president of America, who was insisting that Britain must end all of its imperialism and colonialism and set the colonies free. Uh, this was um, this was important. Now, uh, per, if you could uh, focus the screen on me, I'm seeing a blank screen of uh, uh, Guinilla Peterson. So if you can uh, refocus uh, me so that I know who I'm I'll talking to. i to pin you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, sorry. So let's, let's trace back uh, the history and the impact that the Bible made upon the development of the biblical Jewish Protestant idea of nation, which the present crisis has uh, the theological issue which it has faced. Now, Persia was attacking Greece before Alexander the Great. So you have the history of in Pers Greco Persian wars. Uh, Greece fought valiantly to defend itself, but Greek was divided. Greece was divided between city state. Alexander the Great united. Oh, he was from Macedonia. He united much of uh, uh, Greece and began to invade Persia and did the unthinkable of uh, Greece beating Persia. And then he went down to Baghdad, came all the way to India, which is now actually Pakistan, conquering the world. On his way back, his army couldn't stand the mosquitoes and the heat in India. So he returned and he died in uh, Babylon, uh, but his empire split into four parts as Daniel had already predicted um, 400 years before um, um, Alexander uh, that uh, the empire of Greece will split into four. But then Roman empire, particularly under Augustus uh, Caesar, Julius Caesar, uh, took over. So you had the Roman empire, which during which the Messiah was born, as again, Daniel had prophesied in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter two of Daniel, in, in Daniel's own dreams and visions in chapter seven, uh, that in the time of the fourth beast, fourth empire, Roman empire is not named, Greek empire is named, named in, uh, by Daniel, but Roman is not, but he had predicted that in the times of that fourth beast, uh, God of heaven will raise up a kingdom uh, which will not end. So the uh, Roman Empire, when Jesus is born, Augustus, Caesar Augustus, who is uh, the icon of the Roman Empire, the beast, is ruling. Um, Islam rises and Islam doesn't believe in nations, it believes in caliphate, that under one caliph, which is successor of the prophet, Islam, the faith must grow, and nations are irrelevant. The uh, nation of believers is all one under a caliphate, and it is at war against the nation of unbelievers. So all the unbelievers, our enemies, the house of war, and uh, Islam took over a lot of Christian nations in the Middle East and began to invade Spain and then uh, Constantinople, which was the headquarters of the Orthodox Church and uh, uh, be became a threat to uh, Hungary and to uh, Austria, etc. So, uh, that uh, was th that this imperialism, the spirit of imperialism, 
which the Bible describes as the spirit of Babylon. The biblical word for empire is re really Babylon, which begins in chapter 11 of Genesis, Bab Babel. Uh, but we don't tend to see that, that uh, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 14, which is talking about Lucifer, in Isaiah 14, Lucifer is actually Babylon. We read Isaiah 14 through Mil John Milton's eyes, who sees uh, the fall of Lucifer as the fall of Satan. Uh, that's the standard evangelical perspective with which we read uh, passages in Isaiah and in Ezekiel, which are talking about Babylon. But that's a Babel. Babylon, which continues in the book of Revelation, uh, the chapter 17, 18, uh, we're visiting Babylon again. Babylon doesn't uh, exist at that time, uh, but um, it has uh, disintegrated. But the word Babylon continues, which is destroyed in the end. Now, so Babylon is the biblical world for imperialism, which is what uh, uh, Putin is in theory. Uh, we don't really know how the war will go, how long it will go, what his objectives are, but the attempt to bully uh, Eastern Europe, including Nordic countries, into uh, to stay away from NATO, to uh, be neutral, open towards Russia, uh, is the spirit of imperialism, is spirit of Babylon. Now, normally, uh, you have a lot of theologians in America today, evangelical theologians, who dismiss Genesis 1 to 11 as myth, as stories. Uh, they create a lot of problems for themselves and for the current situation, those people who see Genesis 11 as myth really has, have no moral theological foundations for critiquing Putin. In uh, Genesis 11, what happens is all the uh, people living in Babel are descendants of Noah. They are one people group. They are saying, let's not scatter. God has commanded us to scatter all over the world to fill all the earth, but let's just stay here. Uh, let's build this high tower, a monument, a religious temple. Now, let's say conservatively, there are 50,000 people. 20,000 of them are engaged in this building project. Why? because there are no industries, there are no factories, there are no offices, there is nothing for people to do. How do you feed those 20,000 people who are involved in this building project? Well, you have to send your young men to go into the countryside and gather food. There are five brothers living together, uh, growing, let's say, wheat or rice or corn. Uh, you go there with sticks and stones and say to them, give us all the corn that you have just harvested. Otherwise, we kill you and we take your women. They say, no, 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 please don't uh, take our women. We need them to collect our cow, cow dung and gr grind our uh, corn and wheat and cook our bread. Uh, so please uh, don't take our women. You take the food. We've hidden it. We'll give it to you. So this is the meaning of the city. Jacques Ellul has that book, The Meaning of the City, in which he uh, explains that city is a power structure which exploits the countryside. So in nations such as India, a city means relative prosperity, village, rural areas means poverty, exploitation, where people are living at a subsistence level, barely able to feed themselves. Many of the farmers, about 25, 30 farmers, every single day commit suicide in India. This is distress. 
Now, this is the meaning of the word city uh, until it is transformed and the Bible ends with the New Jerusalem, which is city, the bride of Christ. I won't go into the discussion of this theology of the city, um, but Jacques Ellul's book, The Meaning of the City, and there are many other books. Um, uh, one of the best English book is actually uh, Building Jerusalem by Tristan Hunt. Uh, it's a wonderful study of city, uh, but that's not my discussion today. I'm focusing on the concept of nation. It is, uh, are borders of Ukraine sacred? Should Russia respect them? Uh, are borders of Finland and Sweden sacred? Is God interested in nation? Or is nation a dirty word? As most of European intelligentsia believes today, and in fact, in, even in America, you can't use the word nation and nationalism. You can talk about patriotism, uh, but this is uh, because the evangelical mind has surrendered itself to secular outlook. We speak their language. We are not willing to speak the Bible's language, even though the word nation is used right in the end, in the book of Revelation 21, 22 time, after the millennium in chapter 21, chapter 22 of Revelation, the last two chapters, the word nation keeps occurring. The kings of the nations will bring their wealth <laughs> into the new Jerusalem. The uh, leaves of the tree, this is the last chapter of Gen Revelation, leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. So God is interested in nations. European theology is not interested in nations. Putin is helping th uh, theologians and thinkers to reconsider uh, the whole theological impact of the Bible translation and reformation upon Europe. And that's what I'm focusing on only on one little thing um, that uh, how the Bible created the modern concept of nations, which European intellectuals destroyed. And now they are reaping the consequences of that. They have no moral uh, philosophical foundation for critiquing Russia, but the think tanks have to boldly free themselves from this secular influence, which is shaped uh, by secularism and Roman Catholicism and Orthodox Christianity, which does not take Genesis 11 seriously. Genesis 11, and Genesis 10. So that's my focus, just one point on which I'm hammering. So Europe goes for Persian style Greek empire, followed by Roman empire, which as Roman empire disintegrates, Spain becomes the new holy Roman empire. It was neither Roman, nor holy, but with the blessings of the church, it promoted this imperialism, calling it crescendum, that this is Christ's kingdom, that imperialism is Christ's kingdom. That's where the climax of the Reformation was to fight against uh, the Holy Roman Empire, you know, which begins in Holland and begins to disintegrate uh, the concept of imperialism. Everyone in Europe was trying to build an empire. That's what Brit Britain began to do, Holland began to do, uh, Sweden began to do, Hungary began to do, Russia began to do. Now, why does God destroy Babel as an imperial city? An empire often begins with a city. Rome was a city becomes an empire because city by definition, until it is reformed into New Jerusalem, city by nation is an oppressive, exploitative uh, social structure. Now, it was uh, after the Reformation, when the Bible is translated, when people begin to study the Bible, 
that the Dutch provinces, initially 17 provinces, but they merged with each other. By the end of the eight year war, there are eight provinces. Uh, they, they are saying, we are one people living in this one geographic area, speaking one language, different dialects, but basically one language because the Bible has been translated uh, for all of uh, the Dutch provinces into one uh, Dutch language. Um, so we are one people speaking one language, living in one geography. Why are we being ruled by Spain in the name of Holy Roman Empire? That's what really begins the war. I mean, there were practical reasons for the war against France, uh, but um, it, it is this theological basis that imperialism is wrong because that's what God does in Genesis 11 destroys the imperial city of Babel, confuses the languages of the people. So people split into what becomes nations. Foundation of nation is not ethnicity. This is a foolishness that American theology has exported during the last 60 years. Uh, beginning with Fuller Theological Seminary, the there's, there's School of World Missions, by US Center for World Mission, that a nation means people groups, ethnicity, ethnic. No, all the people living in Babel were one ethnicity, descendants of Noah. One people were divided into nations because of languages. So Nordic nations, Sweden and Denmark and um, Norway and Finland, these are different nations because of different languages. Language is the foundation of nation. This is very important, uh, but we won't go into the details of this, except that the American evangelical theology has really confused, confused global evangelicalism by defining nation as ethnic, as people group. So God divides an imperial city into different nations by confusing their languages. My question is why? Answer is that empire is Luciferian, diabolical idea for war. Russia must, re if it is to rebuild its empire, it must go to war. If China is to become an empire and take over other countries, it has to go to war. So empire is diabolical, Luciferian. That's why Babylon will be destroyed in, uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, but throughout, in the, uh, not just major prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel, but also minor prophets condemn Babylon. God's recipe for peace is nation. So God divides one people into many nations by confusing the language because you live here. A nation is not a people group. A nation is a people governing themselves in their own language, in their given territory. Territory is important. Governance is important. Language is important. This is what Paul is saying when he comes to Europe he goes to Athens from where, uh, from Greece, this concept of empire has spread all over the world. Paul comes there and he teaches the Jewish idea of nation in Acts 17 verses 26 and 27, that from one man, God created all the nations of the earth. He set their times and their borders. Borders are important. They, have, they are sacred. They have to be respected because God has set, uh, God has created nations. He has set the borders. Now, Paul is quoting uh, Deuteronomy 32, 8. We won't read those verses, but in Acts 17, Paul, Paul is quoting Deuteronomy 32, 8, uh, in which Moses is affirming or uh, uh, explaining what happened in Genesis 10 and 11, which evangelical theology is now dismissing as myth, as stories, 
uh, Paul, uh, Moses is summarizing that, that it is God who created nations and it is God who set their boundaries of the nations. So uh, this, this uh, Jewish idea comes at the end of the Protestant Reformation and begins to break up the Holy Roman Empire, which uh, uh, results in Holland and Switzerland becoming the first modern nations in, in Europe, which uh, inspires the USA. 13 colonies go to war in 1775 against British imperialism uh, that we're here in North America. Why is London ruling over us? Why is London taxing us? Well, we have no representatives in the parliament in London. You are collecting our taxes. We have no say on how you're going to use our tax money. You're not interested in building our roads and bridges and tunnels and uh, hospitals and uh, schools and colleges and universities. We are doing all of that ourselves. So uh, this imperialism must end the ex creation of USA. USA was 13 colonies. It could have become 13 kingdoms. It could have become an empire, colonizing Canada, colonizing Mexico. But USA did not become an empire. Sometimes it has behaved as an empire, such as in Philippines. Uh, but basically, USA became a great nation because that's what God wants. That's why he called Abraham. You follow me. I will bless you. I will make you a great nation. I have created many nations. Now, they don't know how to live as a nation. Russia doesn't know how to live as a nation. Uh, but I will make you a light to the Gentiles, to the nations. And I will make you a great nation because through you, I want to bless all the nations. So when he's taking the Hebrew slaves, freed slaves into Canaan, he's defining their geography, that this is the land that I'm going to give you. You love the territory I'm giving you. You fight to defend it but you don't take over other people's land. You live as a good neighbor because I have given some land to Egyptians and to the Edomites and to Sidonians and to Emirates. I've given them land. You must live as a good neighbor to them. Don't build up a standing army as David was trying to do. And David was punished for it uh, because God wants nation to become a great nation capable of defending itself but not uh, taking over other nations. Now, these were the ideas for which the 80-year war was fought in Holland, particularly in the last 30 years. But in the midst of all of that confusion, the idea of a nation never really gripped a Swedish theology. And therefore, Sweden became an empire uh, for hundreds of years, including colonizing Finland. Um, and these issues are yet to be discussed honestly and faithfully. But thanks to America, USA, uh, in uh, 1940, when Churchill was putting a lot of pressure on Roosevelt to join the war, Roosevelt asked Churchill, what's the difference between Adolf Hitler and you? Adolf Hitler is started to colonize Europe now, Holland and Czechoslovakia and Poland and Russia, uh, France, etc. You have colonized a third of the world. America was your colony. Your North America was your colony. Canada was your colony. Australia is your colony. India is, was your colony. You, uh, British uh, Christians, Protestants, are theologically confused. You are imperialists. If you want USA to support you in the war against Hitler, you have to give up this imperialism because if we help you defeat Germany, what happens? Will you then colonize Germany? Will you colonize Japan? If you colonize Germany and Japan, you, Mr. Churchill, if you uh, colonize Germany and Japan, 
you will have the monopoly of global trade. You will become a problem for all the nations. You will squeeze all the countries, including America. We will not be able to trade. What if we offer better prices to India for the Indian goods than you are offering? Uh, your monopoly of global trade will hurt the Indian producer, will hurt us, and will hurt the world. So it was uh, through the Atlantic Charter, the agreement between uh, Churchill and Roosevelt, that imperialism was given up. Uh, France gave up imperialism, Holland gave up, Belgium gave up, all these European powers gave up uh, imperialism, except for the communists who didn't believe that God created nations. So USSR, uh, particularly after World War II, colonized Eastern Europe, and that collapsed. Is Putin trying to revive that experiment? Uh, if not direct colonization, at least is fear of influence? Uh, that's the question. So my time is almost up. I will conclude in um, uh, two, three minutes and give you time for question. Uh, the point, the, the subject given to me was uh, the Bible's impact in creating modern Western civilization. My summary of what I've said for the last 41 minutes is that the, the idea of nation, sacredness of national borders, that Ukrainians must love their nation, they must fight for their nation. This is a biblical idea. Empire is secular idea, which in Europe begins with Greece, with Alexander, spreads uh, from Rome to Spain, to France, to England, uh, and to Sweden and Hungary and Austria, and everywhere. Um, it is demolished by Protestant theology, but Protestant theologians have not been faithful to the scriptures. They have surrendered to the secular opinion, which thinks that nations are artificial construct, human construct, excellence of history. Are nations sacred? Oh, no, 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 nations are products of war. But there are many children that are product of rape, of incest, of war, of adultery. The child born, is he made in God's image? Is he special to God? Does God care for every child? Is nation God's idea? Does God want Ukraine to be a nation and a great nation? Hopefully as a result of what's happening right now, an awakening of Ukrainian nationalism, Ukrainians will fight the evil in their own countries after they have fought off Putin. Because Ukraine is actually more, actually more corrupt than Russia is. And a reform is needed but uh, this is an opportunity for European think tanks, evangelical think tanks, not to be into the intellectually intimidated by secularism, by Roman Catholicism, by orthodox uh, rejection of the idea of nation, because the Orthodox Church in Russia is not going to oppose, um, is not going to oppose Putin. Uh, it is the the Christian intelligentsia, think tanks like you, that have got to give theological basis, affirm that the Bible is God's word, nation is God's recipe for peace. Empire is devil's prescription for war, devil's strategy for war and oppression. So I close there, uh, one minute before my time is up, and over to you for questions.